Let's get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining the session and our webinar today. Um, good morning, good evening, um, good afternoon, depending upon what time zones you're in. But thank you uh, for joining us. Um, um, the topic of today's webinar is Rethinking Lending for 2021. Uh, it's very pertinent as we, as we are right at entering the new year and see how we re-envision or remodel our lending. Just as a reminder, I think we would like the session to be uh, quite participative uh, using the Q&A um, session. So I would request everyone to please submit your questions uh, through Q&A window at the bottom of the screen and we will address it um, at, at the last. So just as a quick introduction, um, my name is Vinay Bhaskar. I lead Great Risk Solutions at Synaptech. Uh, uh, have about a couple of decades experience in managing great risk across retail and small uh, medium enterprise lending. Uh, proud to be part of Synaptech uh, Group. We are a product company headquartered in New York. Um, that rely heavily on AI and machine learning to improve the credit processes um, for banks and financial institutions. With that, let me jump straight into the agenda for today's discussion. There are primarily three topics that we are going to focus on. First, state of the economy with all that's kind of churning in and around us just wanted to take a quick pulse check on where we are from an economy perspective. Leading that to what we have seen within the credit industry, uh, particularly the shifts in the consumer behavior and that how that translates into the lending for 2021 and uh, what banks or financial institutions should focus on keeping those consumer behavior changes in mind. So with that, let's get to the poll time. I think this is, this is the most exciting part of the webinar. We, we like to invite participants to poll on certain key questions. And as we go through the presentation, we will review some of those results. So I have just released a poll uh, to all the participants. We'll request you to uh, submit your votes on some of those key questions. Um, in case you don't see the pop-up, it could be because your browser is blocking it. So feel free to unblock it. I'll keep the poll open for about four to five minutes before, uh, before I publish some of these results. Okay, so with that, let's jump into the first section um, of our of our presentation, which uh, is the state of the economy. Now, this is an interesting chart uh, on the unemployment rate starting October 2018, spanning across two years. Now, if unemployment is any pulse check on the health of the economy, one would look at this chart and feel quite optimistic. Um, as of the latest figures released by Bureau of Labor Stats in November, on November 6th uh, this year, the unemployment rate stands at about 6.9%. So a significant drop from the peaks of circa 15% level um, that we had seen in March, April timeframe. Um, but having said that, we still are kind of quite far from the pre-pandemic level and a lot of things are masked behind these charts. So the question, is it an early sign of recovery and we are on the right track or are there any hidden forces that could change where the economy is going to lead uh, over, over a period? So just to give more context behind the charts, while the unemployment stands at 6.9% today. We all know that uh, the, the total uh, payroll employment is still down from uh, where it was in February 20 level. In fact, we are down by about 11 million 
uh, jobs compared to the pre-pandemic level. And the loss in jobs is, is not uniform across the sectors. Uh, the dichotomous nature of this pandemic and how it has impacted certain job sectors more than other is, is what uh, is a cause of concern as we look ahead in 2021. So that stands as a reality. The other reality, of course, is that while unemployment is, 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 is at a level where it is, our consumer disposable income has continued to rise over this period um, due to various government interventions and uh, shifts in consumer behavior in terms of spending. So with those, then it begs the question, uh, what is uh, for future for us? Uh, and let me at this point bring up the polls, um, poll results that, uh, that you have all uh, submitted to. Let me end the poll and bring it up. Thank you all for participating. About 70% of you participated in the poll results. So let me bring the results up on the screen for you. Uh, give me one second, please. Okay. So our first question, uh, I hope you're able to see the poll uh, results. If not, let me just read it. Our first question was, do you think that the peak of the crisis is behind us and we are in a recovery mode? 50% um, uh, of you have said, no, the peak of the crisis is yet to, yet to, yet to surface. Uh, while um, the other 50 is divided between, yes, the conditions are going to improve. So that's an optimistic group amongst you, while the other 25% of one fourth are unsure about the future conditions. And I would say all these responses uh, could very well be true because we indeed at this point do not know where uh, the markets or economy is going to head. So. Just looking ahead, um, the recovery path in 2021 is going to be determined by a slew of factors ranging from social, economic, political, and health. Um, we wish the path to recovery is as straightforward as it may get. However, uh, all these determinants are going to shape up the economy in a very convoluted way. Um, some of those reasons I've kind of highlighted on the right. Um, the significant one, of course, being the scale of the resurgence in COVID-19 cases. We are already seeing partial shutdowns in many states across the US and the world due to the resurgence. And the question is, are we heading with that into a wave two or is it still a wave one, which is not yet over? Good news though, is that countering that effect um, of resurgence is the news on the vaccine. Uh, just this morning, Pfizer announced that the vaccine is 95% effective, which is an awesome news for all of us. And hoping that effectiveness holds true in future, the key question that still remains is how soon that vaccine would be available in what quantities and whether the majority would have access to it. So that's a pending question, needs to be seen. Attached to vaccine risk, is a very different type of a risk, especially in the US environment, which is a political risk and smooth transition of parts um, between the parties. Now, um, we all know how that political risk manifests itself into the impact um, that it has on the business and consumer confidence and the spending patterns and, and the entire trajectory of it. So, uh, needs to be seen, January would be the key timeline to assess that risk and how that goes. And of course, the offshoot of that then would be the question on the size and timing of the stimulus package. Um, we, we have all witnessed how critical these government interventions have been uh, for businesses and consumers alike in the past few months and how we have started to witness the behavior shifts as these government programs or packages uh, 
um, ended in September. So I'll share more details on that uh, and the trajectory of delinquencies that we are seeing after these programs ended in the next few slides. But the key point being that there are various scenarios or potential recovery paths that one can assume uh, um, the economy to take. Um, on the slide here is um, uh, presented three uh, US economic outlook for 21 um, uh, with prepared by conference board under three different macro uh, economic slash macro political scenario. So um, the timeline spans on the X axis from November, 2020 until January, 22. So this is more of a forward looking view. Uh, the Y axis is, is an economic outlook uh, with a dotted line uh, um, benchmark to January 29. So assume that's the benchmark level of 100. Uh, and we all know as of November 2020, uh, we are still under uh, the, the pre-pandemic level, somewhere around 97. Uh, and then you would see three different scenarios, an upside forecast depicted in orange, the base forecast in black and the blue is reflects the downside forecast. So let me kind of elaborate real quick on this um, and, and why this is important. So if we focus on the base forecast, which is a black line, it assumes a certain uh, determinants. Uh, so for example, it assumes that there's going to be a moderate rise in COVID-19 over the winter period there is going to be a limited improvement in labor market and consumption going into early 2021. It also assumes that the implementation of limited fiscal stimulus is going to be in Q1 of 21 or early Q2. Um, and an assumption that there will be an approval of vaccine but no broad dissemination. Um, of course, in this scenario, then, as you will see, the uh, monthly economic output returns to pre-pandemic levels somewhere around um, um, end of 2020. Um, upside forecast is a positive scenario, which assumes a new COVID cases level off over the coming months and do not result in lockdowns. There is an assumption of strong recovery in labor markets a large fiscal stimulus in Q1. And of course, vaccinations are becoming widely available in early 2021. Uh, an underlying assumption of course being there are no political disruptions over the coming months. So with these assumptions, the orange uh, line uh, lead us to a monthly economic output returning to pre-pandemic levels by April of 2021. Um, the downside forecast is, of course, a very cautious and negative um, scenario where a pessimistic view, or as we will call it, a double dip recession scenario, assuming a large spike in COVID-19 and lockdowns and all, no additional fiscal stimulus in 21, no vaccine, and a bumpy political transition. Of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of very severe than where we may want it to be, or given where what how C thinks to be progressing, but under that downside scenario, the recovery is still not there um, until 2022. So we hope that the, the the reality is somewhere in the middle. I personally wish it's it's more orange line than than even black or yellow, but that's something that we need to see. So with that, let's switch to our second section of the webinar where I wanted to present some of the um, highlights into credit industry and what's being seen as part of the shift in consumer behavior pattern. So on the slide is um, a consumer credit snapshot as of uh, October of 2020. Uh, it presents a trajectory of consumer debt across the key uh, asset classes since the start of the pandemic, uh, since February, 2020. So that's your uh, benchmark levels. 
the numbers here are uh, taken from Equifax uh, weekly monitoring reports uh, presented by ACPATS as well. Uh, the key highlights there, of course, being uh, key highlights, um, of course, being that consumer debt, um, at overall consumer debt at, at this point stand at its highest level of $14.3 trillion, which is from compared to February levels is up by $130 billion. Um, noteworthy though, that while the overall debt has reached a new peak, the, the household stress, which uh, in certain degrees measured by the financial obligations uh, that consumers have, uh, it has fallen to 13.6% of disposable income in Q2 from a level of 15% in Q1. And we all know what are the reasons that even though the debt is high, the stress is low. And the two key reasons, of course, uh, being the low interest rate environment, which translates into lower payments on mortgages. And second, the forbearance program and the CARES Act. Uh, relief itself that has um, that has caused the stress levels to be high, lower than what they were in in at the beginning of the year. The breakdown of that, the majority chunk, of course, of that 14.3 trillion resides in the residential debt of about 10 trillion dollars. That's gone up by 184 billion since the beginning of this year, uh, and uh, consumers, of course, taking advantage of the low interest rate environment and shifts into their quote unquote safe heavens and away from city slash rental spaces uh, during these COVID times. So that's kind of pretty expected. Um, auto balances, um, even though they are up um, in, in aggregate balances, but if we look uh, deeper into the uh, data, the new auto sales are down 18% year to date uh, used are down 8% roughly compared to the 2019 levels. Uh, and of course, these are governed by the restrictions in travel, stay at home, uh, which has a direct impact on this segment. Card balances, interesting, continue to decline uh, over a period standing at about close to $800 billion, uh, uh, primarily because people paying uh, down their debt and second, not using card as much as they did before, either on the gas or the hotels and all. So all these are kind of expected trend. Student debt is a very interesting one, roughly about one and a half trillion. And we all know most of it is in deferral or other accommodation due to the government acts. Um, noteworthy new student loan origination fell significantly, highlighting that there are less enrollments slash a trend towards an online mode of learning. Now, one thing that stands out across all these originations, uh, even though I've not highlighted that on the slide particularly, is that average FICO on these new originations has increased considerably across their set classes. Manifestation of either the payment deferrals as well as a lower spending pattern that impacts the utilization and hence the score in a positive direction. Now, I'll touch upon that fact later uh, in the discussion to say whether these scores as they stand today are predictive and if certain things that need to be done next year as we, uh, as we map to the shift in these consumer behaviors. A quick sneak peek into the delinquencies as of today uh, on this slide uh, early slash late delinquency levels uh, for the entire year starting January until September. Um, you see, if I focus only on the blue line, which is a 30 day delinquency rate on accounts, you would see a steady decline uh, in the delinquency levels, of course, due to the forbearance as, um, as well as the CARES Act and accommodations which were done. Um, quick context, um, to behind these shots in the timeline, you all are aware, um, the $600 unemployment uh, uh, income injection, which was there ended in July. And then there was extra $300, uh, which was mandated by 
executive presidential order that ended in mid-September. And roughly around those timelines, you would see the spike in the delinquencies uh, trajectory going up. So early delinquencies have tended to move up north. The late delinquencies are still flat, but of course they are going to turn back up as we get the uh, latest data on October, November. So uh, where it goes and, uh, and uh, where it stabilizes, of course, needs to be seen, um, but there is an early level of stress that we are seeing in these reports. Now, as we wait for the delinquencies and loss levels to mature over a period, one thing which is quite certain during this time is that the consumer behavior intrinsically has shifted significantly over the past few months. So on the slide is presented a research published by McKinsey on the fundamental shifts in the consumer behavior. Uh, of course, no surprises, but the in terms of where they are shifting, but in, what is surprising though is the magnitude of that shift happening. So to highlight, first, in terms of consumer spending behavior, the, the shifts being seen uh, more in value and essentials and away from any discretionary categorical uh, categories of products. So roughly about 20 to 40% of uh, uh, the surveyors responded uh, and evaluated to have seen a shift in their buying patterns more on the value uh, goods. Now this, this would be quite critical as banks uh, and financial institutions typically in the credit lending space try to tailor the marketing programs um, and, uh, and cater to what consumers require uh, in 2021. Second significant shift is uh, the flight to digital and omnichannel. I don't have to elaborate why that is happening uh, in the COVID times, um, but what is quite surprising is um, if I zoom into that um, dimension, um, that there is roughly one in four um, surveyors who are open to switching uh, banks uh, to online uh, banks away from the brick and mortar. So the survey, you would say the likelihood of um, the consumers to switch banks post COVID, um, about eight, nine percent are likely or very likely to switch it. 17% are on the fence um, um, and only about 75 or three in four are unlikely or highly unlikely to do so. So that kind of reflects that given the fact that there is no uh, personal touch slash connect uh, as was the case in a branch banking, uh, what uh, banks would have to um, do in 21 and beyond to ensure that there is a customer affinity uh, to the value proposition that the bank's making and the links that bank is establishing with the, with the consumers. Um, a reflection of that uh, flight to digital and omnichannel is also uh, sh being shown in a shock to loyalty. Now this is not just particularly to the bank uh, affiliation, it could be even to your clothier or the brands that you wear and all that. So 73% of US consumers have changed stores or brands or the way they shop. Against no surprise there, because primarily that's being driven by the homebound economy, where 64% of the consumers are not yet resuming uh, their normal out of home activities. And we hope they soon do. Uh, and at least for this year, one in four have decreased their uh, net holiday spending intent. Um, so that's the fundamental shifts that uh, uh, we have observed through that research and will form a backbone on how um, we rethink the lending in 21. So let me at this point uh, bring up the poll results again, just to highlight 
Um, the second question where um, we have asked, have you observed any significant shifts in consumer behavior or spending pattern during this process? Uh, not surprising. Uh, and similar to the research, uh, half of you have seen quite significant changes uh, in the patterns uh, with, and roughly 41% have, uh, have it somewhat. It's only one in 10 who have not seen any material change there. So uh, I think very uh, similar to the research uh, which was seen earlier. Okay. So with that background, let me switch over to the last section and the core of our webinar, which is to say, how do we rethink our lending in 2021? Um, so from our perspective, I think the critical, um, or I would highlight four key determinants to what a success would look like in 2021. The first, uh, being understanding your customer, or they say KYC, which is more in terms of, uh, in, in a very strict sense, uh, documentation and all, but this is a much broader KYC that I'm highlighting here, which is to determine your customer journeys and what their needs are, and understand why does your customer behave the way uh, she does. And I'll elaborate on these points in the next couple of slides and how to do it effectively. But once we do it, the second determinant of success will be to monitor the behavior shift. Um, I think some of the shifts that we highlighted um, uh, through the research, uh, while we hope they are not permanent and transient in nature, but there are certain early warning triggers uh, that uh, financial institutions need to institutionalize in their systems and ensure that we can monitor those behavior patterns uh, in, in real time. Um, the third, of course, uh, being triangulating the predictions. Uh, we have seen that during this pandemic crisis, uh, whatever we assess of the customer uh, in terms of our model predictions have certain biases in it. So uh, the ask and the critical ask would be, how do we remove those biases in model predictions and uh, overlay some measures of customer stability uh, to ensure that the predictions are as accurate as one may desire. Last but not the least, of course, is the test, learn, and relearn uh, uh, element of it, um, which is, alludes to the fact that while the customer behavior is changing, uh, banks, financial institutions are making uh, different assumptions on what that behavior will manifest. How quickly can then uh, um, an institute test those behavioral assumptions and learn from it and deploy it in the strategy uh, while assimilating the learnings? So the focus then in 2020 would be, uh, of course, uh, the customer, uh, customer being at the heart of uh, every decision making. Um, on the right uh, is, is the entire ecospace on how financial institution interacts uh, with a customer, be it in terms of transaction purchases or the customer queries or complaints being registered and what's left as a digital footprint, uh, how many times customer visits the website and browse over uh, either an increase in the credit line for a credit card, for example, options or other menu options. The key thing being here being the, that um, the financial institutions have to go beyond creating the customer 360 profiles because while uh, 360 profiles um, are intriguing, they are just a snapshot view of uh, what a customer is. Um, the shift uh, that's needed to be made is away from making a static profile to a more dynamic profile of a customer, uh, which will help create a unique quote unquote uh, personal segment for each uh, customer and um, that segment then mapped to internal business processes can help you uh, gain much more insights on 
where the customer has been and where the customer is heading. That integration of data sources overall then links to the concept of customer journeys for targeted action. Um, once the institution is able to map out where the customer has been in the past and what is the current state of the customer by looking into the rich feature set, uh, including say a speech or text mining of recent interactions, uh, it is analytically and from a machine learning perspective, um, quite um, easy to assess the transition probabilities of what customer is going to do next um, through a set of predicted models. And then um, basis those predictions uh, an institute can make a possible or targeted actions, of course, under various hats. So uh, representatively on the left, there are um, certain customer attributes as we call it related to the timestamp where the customer is and knowing the history of the customer, if we can assess uh, the requirement, be it in terms of uh, customer requiring a crate line increase proactively or an overdraft um, or a, a need for a personal loan, uh, we can make timely interventions into that space. The case in point um, being if the bank or financial institution can review those activities and assess, for example, um, that on an average customers making 80% um, utilization of the credit card, but uh, over the last two months, if the utilization has dipped to about 50%, uh, there is a high likelihood that there's a silent attrition going on. So maybe uh, the determinants of that or the counteractions that need to be made are either a proactive um, line management or a customer care call to understand what's happening um, within, within that customer behavior. Um, critical of course being the ability to integrate all these various profiles and data sources into your decision engine so that you can make these predictions. And as one make these prediction, um, uh, it also would assist the financial institution to, um, to detect the shift in the, the patterns through early warning uh, mechanisms. Now, early warning uh, from a risk management perspective, um, monitoring has been there since ages. And uh, for most part, monitoring of a customer behavior relies on monitoring the past year loan amounts, which is an obvious marker uh, that many banks currently utilize. Um, however, that marker gets a window of about 60 days of warning. So if somebody has gone 30 day past year or 60 day past year, of course we know the, the customer is telling print, but we also know that most likely there is uh, no recourse in getting that custom back onto the current stage because it's too late in the game already. Uh, so what could be done? Um, by adding an extra alert, for example, um, one can capture uh, these behaviors on time. To exemplify an alert at any time when a customer uses a non-historically utilized freight line, uh, banks gain an extra six to seven months of warning to, to understand why the customer has utilized that, um, that unutilized line and could something be done um, uh, for that customer. Similarly, uh, another way where banks can create the early warning signals by leveraging the transaction data, which uh, of course now is, is, is there in, in uh, banks own systems um, one can look at, for example, a changes in salary income, uh, which uh, of course would give an added advantage in these stress times where payment holidays mask the great risk for some time. So if the, sal if the bank evaluates that there is a significant change in the salary income, uh, the debt levels, of course, are remaining the same given the forbearance and uh, all the adjustments being done. 
the denominator of the debt to income shifts and the credit risk then gets recalibrated. So that those uh, early warning signals then, uh, of course, um, um, timely interventions can be made um, for these customers. Another critical dimension as we head into 2021 um, is revolving around the customer stability and, and the need to overlay um, your standard risk models. Now, it's, it's kind of quite a well-known fact that most of the models uh, were built on historical data from the last decade, which of course is not representative of the current environment. Uh, and hence, one can call them to be uh, not fit for purpose or requiring some adjustments of sorts um, on the predicted levels. Uh, but aside from that, I think one critical challenge which we are seeing in the predictions through those credit models is that those historical credit models generally presumed a gradual impact of the environment on losses with lags, for example, ranging from uh, three months to nine months period. Um, now, all those estimated model parameters have fallen um, um, off their expected range and they will exacerbate predictions uh, because they were never tuned to uh, hold these sudden macroeconomic shifts uh, where unemployment rate shifts from 4% to 15%. So uh, the current economic volatility is making and those models generate very counterintuitive or unintuitive results. Um, and hence, there's a need to, to make those adjustments. Um, and last, uh, of course, um, we all know the payment holiday and the forbearance interventions, how they have uh, clouded our typical indicators of delinquencies that are often used to project future losses. So with all that, then, um, of course, in the modeling arena, there are various ways how those models could be adjusted. Uh, and we believe that model owners uh, need to explore ways um, to ensure that the model remains valid and robust under the current conditions. Um, from one, um, from the customer uh, perspective, one way to triangulate those model predictions um, and in fact, create better insights into it would be to overlay what we call as a customer stability index onto these existing risks model. The concept's kind of pretty st straightforward uh, and intuitive. Um, two customers, both having, uh, one having a score of FICO score of 750, other a FICO score of 650. Um, in, in a regular through the cycle time, but the customer with a better score of 750, if it drops to 600 during stress environment and the other customer drops from 650 to 600 in that stress environment, uh, one would consider the uh, second customer which dropped only from 650 to 600 to be more resilient uh, in that stress period than then the first customer which dropped from 750 to 600. So um, with, with that concept, this, uh, this customer stability index, which, which takes into account the various dimensions of the customer, such as income, uh, the credit profile, the demonstrated instability, and this uh, demonstrated instability is during the period of stresses, um, either, the, the local state regional um, uh, stress environment or a macro stress environment such as global recession. Uh, with all those dimensions, then one can create a measure of stability index that uh, provide a level of confidence whether a score of 750 is going to remain stable or not uh, over a period of time. So on this slide, uh, when we created that index and tested it out on a group of customers, we saw that within a score band itself, so uh, which is represented on the x-axis, uh, the various FICO bands uh, ranging from thin file and going all up to 850 buckets uh, with their bad rates on the y-axis, 
we split each of these four bands uh, by our uh, stability group indexes. So the dark orange is going to be uh, uh, highly unstable uh, versus the, the dark black um, being highly stable. You would see that how within a particular FICO band itself, there is a huge separation uh, of risk uh, by the stability groups. So it helps you rank order accounts uh, within the score bands and identify the ones which are more likely to go delinquent, particularly under the unexpected financial stress scenario. So the call out there being, uh, while you adjust your models through a variety of statistical measures, uh, look out for unique customer profile behavior patterns that you can uh, triangulate under stress period uh, to create certain profile groups, which when overlaid on a typical FICO score would give you um, a boost to the risk differentiation. With that then, um, of course, uh, to my last and final point, um, that as you create these profiles and um, make certain assumptions about consumer behavior, spend patterns, or risk behaviors, there is a critical need for agile testing and implementation of your strategies so that in real time, um, within three to six months as against a typical learning cycle of 12 to 18 months, you can make assessment of whether your assumptions have translated into the expected response from the customer or you need to um, revisit your strategy and then relearn from here. And for this one, uh, operationally, um, banks have to be agile in integrating their data systems and implementing solutions that uh, allow them to ingest multiple strategies at the same time, as well as monitor them um, over a shorter period of time, uh, rather than the classic um, 12 to 18 month learning window. So that in summary, uh, primarily, brings us to four key dimensions. Um, again, um, our recommendation would be that review the problem from the customer perspective, understand where your customer is in the journey um, by connecting all the data that you can gather on the customer, uh, not just in a static time point, but also how that customer journey has mapped over a period of time. And as you do so, monitor the behavior shifts. Um, example, utilization higher, turning to lower. Um, that, of course, can be institutionalized in an early warning trigger mechanism. Um, and as you make predictions about a customer um, through standard uh, credit risk models, uh, include certain overlays of customer stability and behavior patterns. Uh, and of course, you have to keep testing your assumptions and uh, keep learning uh, from the outcomes therein. So with that, I am at the last section of our uh, webinar, which um, I would um, encourage everyone to participate in uh, the Q&A. There is a Q&A um, box at the end of your um, screen request you to post your questions and I will address it in real time. So um, I will wait for the questions to pop up. Um, okay, I'm already seeing a couple of questions. The first, will the materials be distributed? Of course, I think uh, we will have these um, materials right on our website, so you can um, go and have a look at it as you want. Um, so yes, uh, these materials will be distributed uh, to all the participants and on our website. Um, 
The second question um, that I'm receiving is uh, on the early warning indicators, which the question reads, shouldn't we have had these indicators before the crisis hit? Uh, how will they help me in the next crisis versus just reacting now to the one that has already hit? Um, interesting question. And in, in fact, I think it, it is valid. Um, it's, it's hindsight 2020, everybody's learning from uh, how consumers shifting pattern uh, and how that needs to be incorporated into the strategy design but the fact uh, remains, um, this crisis or not, um, we all need to gear to learn through early warnings. And these early warnings are, um, can be used from both positive and negative trigger point in understanding customer behavior, um, irrespective of whether you're in a pandemic situation or not, uh, I think to the extent, uh, there is a partnership between, between banks, financial institution and customers. Um, we need to have mechanisms to learn from how the customer's behaving and not just on an aggregate. I think one of the challenge uh, where um, we get entangled most of the time, especially in the retail uh, financial sector is because the data is so huge that we generally try to create segments and average out the behaviors, right? So a particular segment of the score and a spend pattern, and that's our expectation. And then that average then masks a lot of hidden patterns, especially for a particular customer and, and customer needs. And that's where those early warning trigger mechanisms, which run um, not at a portfolio level, I mean, you can do it, create those mechanisms of portfolio, but also at a singular customer so that you can understand this, the, the single source of truth and what interventions are required for that customer. So that's that's the key message there. Yeah. Um, okay, um, we'll keep requesting you to uh, send the questions. The other one that I am seeing is, how do you think about data sources with regards to quality? For example, comparing indicators coming out of open source government data versus third party sources, uh, specifically bureaus. Uh, yes, very, very critical. Um, um, of course, any data that you leverage in your strategy, of course, has to be triangulated, gone through the data quality checks, and especially in the credit um, risk world, which is heavily governed and regulated by a set of what actions can be taken, not taken. Uh, we highly recommend that any source you use for any adverse action um, ensure that all those <clears throat> attributes are FCRA compliant and you do proper diagnostics into the fair lending slash ECOA requirements to ensure there is no disparate impact generated by leveraging the attributes that you do. Uh, but um, thank you for asking that question. It's, it's very, very critical that we understand that uh, in this big data environment where one can go to social media <clears throat> to understand what customers tweeting or not, uh, let's be prudent in creating signals out of it and ensure that uh, we are not uh, systemically creating biases into our decision-making process. So yes, absolutely very critical to ensure the quality of the data. Um, the other question that I've received is um, about the test and learn framework. Would it require tech change at RN have you done it in particular? Um, of course, I think test and learn environments um, is, is, is not a new concept. It's been prevalent in the industry uh, for, for quite some time. The challenge uh, though has been the agility of um, that test and learn framework. Uh, one, from an aspect of deploying your strategies um, 
as you want it and when you want it, uh, especially, I think, in my experience, um, getting a strategy ready is one um, dimension of this agility, but the other dimension being working through the technology requirements to translate it in the way it needs to be coded uh, and then deploy. So uh, <clears throat> there is a need to make fundamental shifts in that. Of course, in our, our experience and how we manage it, uh, there are our platform systems can ingest these strategies uh, at, a, at a really uh, uh, rapid speed. Uh, and not only is there a need to ingest these strategies, but also to learn from these strategies in, in a real time as the case may be. <clears throat> so early warning performances, um, rather than, as I said earlier, waiting for uh, a typical 12 month performance to evaluate your particular scorecard slash strategy. How can you map that 12 month uh, into a certain projection of early delinquency so that you can start tracking you know, for that strategies um, in, in real time. Uh, okay, I'm seeing a few more questions. So thank you for sending that. The next one, um, that I see is what opportunities do you think ML can create to deal with the current environment? Um, I think plenty. I covered this aspect in a joint webinar that we held a couple of months, in fact, last month as well. Uh, machine learning is an interesting space um, and, and it has proven itself many fold, especially in these times uh, because one, its ability to ingest and work with large dimensions of data. Uh, and second, the non-linearity uh, aspects that machine learning attempts to capture uh, as against a typical linear slash logistic regression model is what makes this technique uh, quite pertinent, um, not just in normal time, but, but specifically in um, in the in the crisis period as well. So um, all the early warning signals uh, that I was talking about um, behind the scene analytics slash machine learning that go behind it uh, to create uh, powerful signals for a customer basis the behavior um, is is the critical output of the machine learning. So uh, there is an opportunity of machine learning in the in the credit space account management. Uh, collections, early warning system uh, triggers, operations, um, uh, and fundamentally any touch point that uh, you you have with the customer and where you have uh, certain data, you may or may not need uh, an outcome. So it could be uh, supervised or unsupervised uh, learning for those machine learning algorithms. But yes, anywhere where you have certain pieces of signals uh, where as you interact with your customer, uh, machine learning would be able to provide immense value in there. Okay. Um, interesting question says, on the one hand, there is a push from the government to induce more liquidity to the economy. Uh, and internally, there is a battle to tighten originations in light of COVID. So how do you balance the two? <laughs> um, Everybody has a role to play in the economy. Government, of course, uh, has to balance out um, various objectives, ensure that there is uh, not a severe impact of this pandemic on various uh, various sectors or subsectors. Um, while financial institutions, of course, are customer centric, they, they need to also ensure that they have the prudent risk management practices because of which they will have to tighten originations uh, or they have tightened originations um, in the past. Now, um, the, the real, I, I guess the real question is not um, that why um, originations were tightened and does it come into conflict with governments injecting liquidity in all, I think, um, there are multiple objectives and they need to be solved together uh, in, in, a, in a broader framework. Um, to me, the more pertinent question is that <clears throat> as banks and financial institutions tighten the originations, uh, the question is 
how have they tightened? Is it uh, primarily based on, um, say, a blunt score cutoff shifts um, and saying, okay, if you were originating at the margin of risk, uh, now I go down and stop originating the bottom 10, 20, 30% basis the FICO, or is there um, a, a more intelligent uh, slash customer overlays that are baked into to see how do we, how do we uh, prudentially uh, originate? Uh, and, to, and to your point, uh, uh, of course, uh, we need to balance the social impact uh, of our decisions with uh, the profitability or the risk management dimensions to it. But the critical thing um, as, um, and I will kind of uh, reiterate is that keep customer behavior and customer needs in mind uh, and assess it accurately uh, as you go into 21. I think most of the time we are blindsided by the model assumptions and the blunt cuts um, without looking at the accurate signals that could be there. Uh, leverage uh, the tools and techniques, leverage machine learning, leverage early warning, whatever you have at your disposal to ensure that you understand those triggers really well before you take any blunt actions on these customers. But these are not conflicting. The question is conflicting objectives in the sense government versus financial institutions. The question is how do you jointly determine the outcome in an equilibrium space um, rather than taking um, misinformed decisions? Okay, I think we are going to be almost close to our hours, maybe a time for one of the question I have four or five, which are in the queue. But well, let me pick up uh, one of it. Uh, it says, what is your assessment on impact on FICO score from CARES Act? Um, I think I touched upon it a uh, little bit in today's webinar. We did discuss this topic in detail in the past. Um, the impact on FICO from KIS Act perspective um, uh, has been only in one direction. I think we have seen it in many cases where the average FICO has increased uh, across the spectrum uh, of customers, I'm sorry, uh, primarily because there is a forbearance, uh, primarily because uh, um, of these adjustments being applied that on an average, even though intrinsic risk profile hasn't changed, uh, but the FICO scores have gone up um, by at least 15, 20 uh, points on an average, um, especially on the new originations as well. Uh, and of course, on the existing book, uh, you, banks have seen you know, increase in FICO, not just due to the CARES Act, but also due to, for example, the utilization pattern being low and just um, with that factor, um, the score shifts tremendously. Now, whether it's a true reflection of the intrinsic risk behavior, uh, needs to be seen uh, uh, over time, but our recommendations being to overlay um, the customer stability parameters uh, and not just rely on, on an average predictions made by standard scores uh, to evaluate the credit risk. So that would be, I believe, our end of our webinar for today. I think there are a few other pending questions which we will address offline uh, for the attendees. But thank you again, all of you for joining today, submitting your questions and participating in this. Thank you very much. Have a happy Thanksgiving and a new year if you don't talk before. With this, we will end the webinar. Thank you.